Hey, this is Coach Boydston, and in this screencast, we're going to be talking about some other uh, mechanisms for evolutionary change. Um, in a previous screencast, we talked about natural selection and how over time, organisms will change and become more fit. If they're more fit, they survive and reproduce and pass those traits on. That's what Darwin's idea was. Well, we're going to look at some other mechanisms that also drive evolutionary change. Before we do that, I want to bring up these two guys. This is Hardy and Weinberg. Um, what they did was they came up with a principle that said if these things, you can see the selection here on the, on the left, selection, non-random mating, mutations, gene flow, genetic drift, if these things are happening, evolution is going to take place. But if these things are not happening, then that group of organisms in that population are going to be at what we call stasis, basically not evolving. And so they created basically a mathematical equation for, for gauging evolution. So it was really helpful. And so if we look at our things here on the left, we have selection, which is like natural selection. You have non-random mating, which obviously is the opposite of random mating. Um, that kind of relates to like humans, like what we do. Um, I'll bring up this picture here. We didn't talk about this with our natural selection talk the last time, but there's also a form of natural selection we'd call sexual selection. And so you can see this with peacocks here. Obviously, you see the female down here on the right. She's really focused in on this male with these beautiful feathers. Um, with peacocks, the females like to mate with the ones with the big, beautiful feathers. And so this poor guy here on the left that has uh, this very sad-looking group of feathers, probably going to have a tough time finding a mate. And so since that is the selection, that's the trait that's being selected, um, that's just a form of selection, natural selection, how traits are, are going to be driven and how natural selection will be driven by this sexual choice. It also kind of forms into non-random mating. So these uh, particular female peacocks, they're not randomly mating. They're actually choosing because of certain characteristics. Us as humans do that as well. Um, hopefully we don't just go out random mating. Wouldn't be advised. All right, but, but humans, we, we don't mate randomly. We generally mate with somebody that is of likeness to us. All right, similar alleles. Um, somebody that appeals to us because they're similar to us. And so that's what they're saying. So Hardy and Weinberg would say if they're just randomly mating, and that's all that's going on, well, then evolution probably is not going to take place as long as there's not some type of selection taking place. But if there's non-random, they're being picky or choosy, kind of like these peacocks, then evolution we're going to see take place. Mutations we know about. Mutations, obviously, are when there's changes in the DNA that could change the allele, which also could change um, the protein, which will change the physical trait. And if that's happening, then obviously we're going to get uh, a new type of allele that could be introduced, which if it's favorable and natural selection chooses it, all right, through that process of Darwin's natural selection, then we could see that happen more often. So the two I want to look at here is gene flow and genetic drift. Those are the ones we haven't really talked about. So the first one is gene flow. Anytime we have a population that has been separated by a geographic barrier, so right now that is my face, all right, could be uh, the Grand Canyon, could be a big body of water, whatever it may be, um, those two populations, they could be the same species, but obviously they're in different locations, so they're going to evolve a little different according to natural selection. So gene flow just says this, well, what if some genes from one population flow over into the other? So like if A was to flow over into B, well, that's going to affect that population over there in population B. We now just have introduced new genes into that population. If that new gene is well selected for that area, then we're going to start to see an evolution or change within that population. Same thing could happen here. The population B could gene flow. They could flow over into population A. Now, obviously, they would have to cross that barrier. They'd have to find a way across the Grand Canyon. Um, they'd have to find a way across that body of water. But genes can flow in and out of populations. And if we have gene flow in and out of populations, that's going to affect the allele frequencies within those populations evolution could take place through natural selection in that in that instance. Um, an example of this, I came across this article here in Time. It's called The New Faces of America. You can see it there. Basically, they're saying that, you know, the world's getting so global. I mean, things are getting so small, meaning that, uh, you know, America is very, very diverse. We have many different people from many different countries that come to America to go to college, do different things. And so with that gene flow from other countries into America, they basically ran all these faces of the different cultures represented in America through a uh, face recognition software, and they came up with this is the new face of an American. It looks a little, I see some Hispanic uh, roots it looks like, and I don't know, it's just something about the eyes maybe. All right, but it's just showing you this idea of how gene flow can affect populations. So I thought that was a really good example. The last one here is genetic drift. 
Now, genetic drift, as you know, will affect small population size a lot more than it will affect large population size. And here's why. Genetic drift, if this is our population here, you can see we are, have a 2 to 1 ratio of green to red. So a lot more green alleles showing up here in this gene pool. Now, if a, a catastrophic event happens, a lot of them die. So let's see that. And then we're left with the survivors. Now, what do you notice about those survivors? Well, there's a 3 to 1 ratio of red to green now. So there's actually more of the red allele showing up in these survivors. Well, if there's nothing else acting upon this for natural selection, this group of survivors, and they start reproducing, we're going to see a greater number of frequency of the red allele showing up. And so genetic drift through a catastrophic event has caused evolution to take place actually fairly quickly within this population. And so obviously if I had a group of 10 organisms living in a space and we have a, a tornado blow through and kills most of them, leaves two of them, well genetic drift is going to really affect that group. The genes of that gene pool just got shrunk very, very quickly. The frequency of those alleles got very, very small. Um, if we had a group of 10,000 organisms living in an area and a tornado blows through, kills a portion of them, it's not going to affect that population as much. And so genetic drift really will affect populations that are smaller in size, um, shifting those genes over into a different frequency than what they were before. So these are just, like I said, mechanisms that allow for evolutionary change over time. And so um, hopefully that was helpful to you guys. Uh, gene flow, genetic, real simple combinations. But the driving force really is natural selection. Because if gene, genes flow into an area, it's natural selection that's going to drive the change within, within that population. So I'm Coach Boyce, and hopefully that was helpful to you guys. Have a good day.